the uh, press briefing about this high-level week. All right, thank you very much for uh, your interest. Um, uh, welcome to our, our colleagues from uh, Germany as well, I think, I'm oh, just leaving. Um, you're very welcome to stay if you'd like. Uh, I'm here to introduce the President of the United Nations General Assembly, uh, His Excellency Mons Lukatoft, who's gonna brief us on the, uh, the upcoming week and particularly the uh, events uh, on Thursday, the, the, the General Assembly uh, high-level thematic debate on the sustainable, achieving the sustainable development goals. Sir. Thank you, Dan. Before I talk about that, uh, allow me to extend the sincere condolences and solidarity of the General Assembly with uh, the Ecuadorian and Japanese governments and people who have deep, been deeply affected uh, by the deadly earthquakes over the weekend. Our thoughts are with all those who lost loved ones and indeed with all those who are working hard at the relief efforts. I also uh, think it's appropriate to, to mention that exactly one year ago, the whole world was shocked uh, to the core by the loss of nearly 800 migrants in one single incident in the Mediterranean Sea. And still more tragedies are happening in those waters. Uh, my thoughts and deepest sympathies go to all those who have lost uh, lives and family members of them. And it's all of it a call to the European Union and all countries in the region to do their utmost to protect the lives of migrants. We had a busy last week, and I think we all had exchanges on that very important discussion on this, the, with the candidates of the general, for the next Secretary General. Tomorrow and the, the following days, we will have also very important events taking place in the General Assembly. We will, uh, the next two days, we will hold the high-level UNGAS meeting on world drug problems. Uh, it provides a much-needed universal platform for member states and other stakeholders for discussing one of the most serious and complex issues that countries uh, uh, are meeting continuously, who affect lives of millions and of people and undermine sustainable development, as well as political stability and democratic institutions. On Thursday, I am hosting the first high-level meeting since uh, the SDGs were adopted in September, uh, adopted on an unanimously to end poverty and promote protected prosperity and well-being uh, while protecting our environment. At, at these meetings, 128 member councils will be present as well, uh, and uh, at least uh, 28 heads of states and government, and seven vice presidents, a number of other ministers. But we will have the financial sector, the private sector, uh, the NGOs, a wide range of people from civil society present. Uh, and I want to remember you that it took, in general terms, seven years before the world started implementing the, the Millennium Development Goals after the year 2000. This time, we all have the intention to kick start implementation uh, after seven months, and that's what the meeting on Thursday is all about. We need to hear from member states whether the efforts to achieve the 17 Sustainable Development Goals are on track at the regional, the local, and the national levels, because achieving our goals and ensuring uh, that no one is left behind will require everyone on board it will require the empowerment of women and girls everywhere. The high-level meeting will f focus on the essentials, including 
finance, technology and partnerships, and it will help forge new partnerships between governments, private sector, civil society, to support actions to implement both the Agenda 2030 and the Climate Agreement, which is actually a part of the overall sustainable development uh, program. We cannot achieve the goals without private financing. We need partnerships, we need exchange of technology, and recently with the publication of the so-called Panama Papers, we saw an example of the world, uh, of a wor world wide tax evasion, a and a world without tax revenues cannot mobilize the domestic resources we need, both in poor and rich countries, in order to implement the 17 SDGs. So taking action on climate change, uh, as well as sustainable development in general, is critical for achieving uh, the overall goals, and the implementation of the Paris Agreement will be decisive for the implementation of the uh, other parts of the 2030 Agenda. Uh, the signing ceremony uh, of the Paris Agreement uh, on Friday, back to back with our arrangement on Thursday, is an important first step toward ensuring that the agreement enters into force as soon as possible. And prospects seem to be very good here. The link between promoting peace, prosperity, and environmental protection has never been clearer, and everyone needs to know that the implementation of the SDGs uh, is in everyone's best interest. So that's why we are making this big gathering with nearly as much attention as the normal opening week of, of, of the General Assembly. Uh, we on Thursday, the Secretary General on Friday, but in a joint venture to make the broadest possible attention uh, to the need of implementing the great agreements. Yes. Thank you. Now let's have a question. Uh, Mr. President, good morning. Thank you for the press conference. The, my question is this. Related to the candidate of the as a UNG, do you, th do you think that they will utilize this opportunity of 120 heads of state or representative of big state here to campaign? And if they campaign, do, you, do they have to follow rules after they present all their platform to the... General Assembly, or they're free to do whatever they want? And how many do you expect more candidates? If you expect more candidates from now on, and when do you plan to have a second round of uh, audit for them? Yeah. Uh, th there will be, of course, a round for those who may drop in from now on. And we haven't set a, a specific time for that because we, we don't know exactly what the picture is. But 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 we will try to be sure that there is no more candidates and, and then have the rest of them on a, on a short list uh, to be presented as early as possible. That's, that's my intention. Uh, and the candidates, of course, are free to, to, to canvas and lobby wherever they, they will uh, with, with, with governments. Uh, uh, I, I mean, yes, I, I, they are all in, I, I invited uh, to take part in the Thursday uh, events, not with any speaking role, but they are invited, they are around, of course, they can take conversations with each and every one they want. So I see, see no problem in that. I think it's very appropriate that they have the opportunity to be at the, at, at, at the discussion and listen to it, because it's the, the, the very core of the work one of them will have to, to fulfill uh, afterwards. Yeah. There's a question there, and then we'll come uh, to this lady. Yeah, uh, Joseph Klein, Canada Free Press. My question is, to what extent do you think uh, it would be useful or do you intend to use social media uh, to engage civil society in an ongoing conversation about best ways to implement the SDGs? Is, is, is are social media going to be part of your uh, rollout uh, to uh, in incentivize implementation and, and get more inputs from civil society? Certainly, yes. Whatever we can do on the social media is very important. We, we saw how much attention it was uh, possible to get on the process of selecting the next Secretary General with 230,000 people engaging. Yeah, I think 260,000 people we, we, watching the webcast yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. of the hearings. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so it's very important. and, and, uh, and 
what is even more uh, uh, optimistic is that they just left a meeting uh, with uh, the faith leaders uh, f from all the major faiths, uh, representing all the major faiths, uh, who turned over to me a declaration of support for the climate action. Uh, uh, if those faith leaders join forces with us, they are the strongest, the most wide-reaching part of civil society we can, we can, can hope for. Uh, and if they join in on the social media as well as faith leaders, I think it would be a very, very important contribution. As, as we all remember uh, His Holiness the Pope being here in September and how important his engagement towards his constituency of 1.2 billion Catholics uh, uh, is for, for the, whole, the, the whole undertaking here. Um, if I could just add add to what the president said, the the hashtags for the uh, for the SDGs and the meeting are uh, hashtag SDGs and hashtag Global Goals. Those are two hashtags which have been out there since September. They they're going to be continued to be used. Uh, we're working closely with DPI on a large social media um, uh, plan around this meeting. Um, so there's there's going to be lots of people following that. And we've also, uh, we've also uh, invited uh, into the uh, Express Bar on the third floor a number of digital social media um, uh, journalists, as, uh, for want of a better word, who will be following the meeting and hopefully uh, tweeting and blogging and, and, uh, and webcasting about the events that are happening on Thursday. So we said we'd come here and then we'll go uh, over there. Thank you. Welcome, President Likitov. Um, this is a thread of the first question I ever asked you. Um, the Millennium Development Goals the UN was committed to, uh, after 15 years, Oxfam issued a report saying that 164 individuals controlled more wealth than uh, half the planet, half the, in the human beings on the planet. So um, actually, it seems as though the Millennium De Development Goals did not accomplish that much, and Jeffrey Sachs himself was infuriated. I've heard him at many, many meetings that a fortune was being spent on the Iraq War, and that money could have funded the Millennium Development Goals. Now, the 2030 agenda, um, I know you just said you were very upset that uh, tax evasion um, is rampant and that you need fi private fun financing. But the, the source of the greatest amount of, of resource, financial resource, would be the military budgets. And when Jeffrey Sachs was here uh, about two weeks ago in the Conference on Inequality, he said that the US spends 20 times the amount on the military that it does on, on investment in human beings. And I did speak with someone, I suppose I, I can't name, here, who <laughs> said that um, there is a fear of, of suggesting the military budgets at resource, as resource for the uh, 2030 agenda because there are certain countries that have opposition to that. What can be done to change that so that instead of, the New York Times yesterday had a, a front page article on trillions of dollars being spent on nuclear weapons um, and a new arms race. So it seems as though you, you're fighting an uphill battle. And unless the two are, are somehow or other brought together, where are you going to be in 15 years? Well, the very, very, very relevant questions. I mean, I think uh, uh, you mentioned the cost about the, the uh, Iraq war, I think at a very early stage of that invasion, we could count that we could have provided clean water for every human being for the costs of the Iraq war. So the, there is a very, very uh, important connection here, or lack of connection. Uh, but on the, uh, the uh, Millennium Development Goals, you can say they were uh, in a way successful because the main goal to uh, reduce to half the number of extremely poor people were, uh, was reached. 
There were a number of, of goals not quite reached, and they are still on the list, of course, of the Sustainable Development Goals. But I think uh, one problem is, and I really hope that the UN can contribute to restart disarmament instead of armament uh, development. That's one problem. The other problem is, uh, even with, with the military expenditure, there are resources on this globe uh, to meet the Sustainable Development Goals, but it will take two major decisions, which is, I think, uh, quite at the core of what the sustainable development is all about. It will take action now to avoid climate change uh, in order to avoid all the conflicts and refugee uh, waves that would follow of a, an accelerating climate change, which will soak up the rest of the possible resources for sustainable development. That's point one. And that's why climate change action is so urgent. The other one is we need to mobilize resources. Uh, and a major part of those resources will have to come from rich companies and rich people paying taxes wherever they earn them. Because uh, that's much more important for developing countries in order to meet the sustainable development goals, to meet the requirements of global action, than uh, uh, international development assistance. That has to be there also, and that will be easier to contribute if rich countries also get the tax revenues from rich people. So uh, there are all these connections, of course, and I, I think that, that the Panama Papers are important and useful to get up out in the global public because they will speed up action against global tax evasion. I mean, we, you have to... to to have the figures in front of you, what, 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 we, have, what we saw in the humanitarian uh, report uh, that came out in January in Dubai, where the Secretary General and I was present also for, in the presentation, was that we needed an extra at least $15 billion for the short-term humanitarian relief, which is also a part of ever going to a sustainable development. But is that a lot of money? Not, not compared with military expenditure, not compared with so much else, not compared with what we used uh, to, to, to mobilize, to reconstruct a, a middle-sized bank during the financial crisis. Yeah. It's not a lot of money. Mm -hmm. It sounds like a lot of money, but it's actually 25 cents out of every thousand dollars earned on this globe every second that we need. And, and, and that's why even with a tragically increasing military investment uh, mentioned, we should be able to mobilize the necessary humanitarian and development resources. Thank you very much, Dan. Uh, Mr. President, <coughs> just to follow up on my colleague question. Could you just uh, tell us who you are and, and which yes, uh, media I'll, outlet? I will. I thought I'm very well known. but You're very sorry. well known, but not All necessarily right. to the president. My name is Erol Avdovic, E-R-O-L, Avdovic, <laughs> A-V-D-O-V-I-C. <laughs> and I'm representing Republica Press with the number of the Balkan newspapers and media. Uh, for 24 years, past 24 years here. Uh, I was going to ask you, uh, my colleague actually asked you about the, uh, whether they are going to be able to lobby the candidates for the SG are going to be lobbied. But I would like your specific comment or whatever comment from your point since you've heard them all from the first row. Uh, would be necessary actually for them to lobby since this is different than becoming a president of General Assembly, this is uh, becoming a secretary general of the United Nations which means that the ball is still in the hands of the Security Council. Would they only need to lobby to the 15 member states of the Security Council? So that's my question. And two quick uh, uh, technical questions. Are they going to wait for all of them, next candidates, to be like another group and present them in the next panel or one by one? And also, what does it mean that you are going to, as you mentioned, you're going to wait for a uh, list somebody to drop out from the list. What does it mean, actually? I didn't mention that. Uh, well, uh, I understood that somebody may drop out from the list, and we will have a shortened list then. Or you yeah, that may happen, but I didn't mention it. <laughs> uh, OK, what, about, what does it mean, having a shortened list of the candidates? No, no. What, what, what's going to happen with, with the candidate uh, uh, presentation in the General Assembly is that now we, I urged 
governments and candidates to come forward with uh, what may be out there of more suggestions for Secretary General. So we can have a new round with those extra candidates that may be there. We have heard rumors, but we have no specific confirmation that there are more out there. Uh, and I hope we can present them in a role, of course, as we did last week, each by their own, in a two-hour uh, session, uh, exactly as we did it with the, the, for the first nine candidates. Uh, and, and uh, well, uh, of course, the Security Council have a key word here. We know that. But what I said, uh, I have said repeatedly over this process, and uh, I think even more people realize that it is like that after the hearings or the informal dialogues we had last week. Uh, if there is a critical mass of member countries supporting one candidate over the, the spring and the summer, if that happens, I think it will be very unlikely that the Security Council will come out with quite a different name. If there is a lot of, uh, a lot of con candidates and no clear favorite, well, yes, the Security Council will probably have a key role uh, alone as it used to be. But it, it's up to what, how member states will actually react to this process. There is, the, for the first time, a real possibility of the general membership having a real influence. Yes, thank you. Um, I have two questions. One, a follow-up question on the SG um, uh, election. Um, would you please uh, give us a t time table, kind of, like when the Security Council is supposed to meet? Is it in July, if I under to, to discuss this question? And is it theoretically at least possible that the Security Council go also uh, could give two, uh, a nomination of two uh, um, candidates as a suggestion to the, uh, um, uh, the meeting of the assembly later uh, in September. And my second question is on the SDGs uh, goals in the SDGs and um, whether there will be a mechanism to um, look on each country and how they are going to meet or not meet their goals. Uh, thank you. Yes. Uh, and my name is Ibtisam Azim from Al Arab Al Jadid newspaper. <laughs> Sorry, I forgot. To thank you. Thank you. Uh, we, we know uh, that in the revitalization group, they're still discussing uh, questions which were not included in, in the resolution about this more open, transparent process and formal dialogues. For instance, the question of one term not extendable in, uh, of seven years instead of possibility for re-election, the possibility of asking the Security Council to bring for, forward for the first time more than one. I don't know what the outcome will be of, uh, of this. Uh, and I don't know when the Security Council, it's their uh, uh, own decision, when they will start negotiations. I have also heard that there are, uh, uh, it has been said late July from, from the side of the Security Council they will start deliberations on this. But, but when there will be a, con a conclusion, I, I certainly don't know. Uh, because that's out of, of my hand in any way. What, what I have said is that f from the General Assembly point of view, even if a candidate may come in that late when the Security Council has started its de deliberation, I intend to try to hold a informal dialogue with that candidate uh, exactly in the same way as we have done with the first ones. On the SDGs, uh, I mean, yes... We are working with all these indicators, first of all, so that we can compare national uh, performance. And, and we are urging, and that will be part of the discussion on Thursday, member states to have national plans and be accountable on how they improve in living up to the, the uh, SDGs. And of course, uh, most of the work will have to be done at the national level. I mean, it's governments and, 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 and their partners on the national level that, that will do most of the work. What we can do is the supervision, the uh, encouragement from the side of the UN and be, make sure that we have 
the best possible tools to compare between countries and development in countries. Yes, uh, my name is Abdul Hamid Sayam from uh, the Arabic daily Al Quds Al Arabi. And I have two questions. Uh, first, are you scheduled, sir, to meet with uh, President Mahmoud Abbas in his uh, coming to the, uh, to the signing ceremony? And if you are meeting with him, what issues you're going to be discussing with him? And my second question, would you anticipate that the Security Council at one point will call on you to give them your feedback and assessments of the candidate? being the person who monitored all this process, and you have accumulated excellent knowledge of every candidate, would you be called on to give your input on that? Thank you. Last question. I, I don't know of any intention to do that, but, but I will try to live up to every uh, call <laughs> that's made to me. Uh, on, on, on meeting with President Abbas, uh, I, I have no arrangements uh, made, uh, uh, but as you know, I've met with the president on several occasions in the, in the past, and uh, if, if, if he so wants, I will, of course, uh, try to meet with him again. Very good. Sure. Thanks a lot. Matthew Lee, Inner City Press, on behalf of the Free UN Coalition for Access, thanks for being available once again. Uh, I wanted to ask you, you mentioned the Panama Papers, and this yeah. also came up in a civil society press conference at 11 here by something called the, the Financing for Development Group. Mm -hmm. And so I want I, I to ask you what I asked them, which is that rather than only being something, you know, a sort of a big corporation thing out there that the UN system can act on and talk about, it seems to have penetrated the UN system itself. There was a story in McClatchy on, over the weekend saying that South South News, which is one of the entities of, of the, the Macau-based businessman, is in fact in the Panama Papers, was incorporated in British Virgin Islands. And, and so I guess what I'm, what I'm wondering is, do you think I mean, a development like that, does it require the UN system itself to, to, to review how these offshore entities may have penetrated the UN system? And also, at this, this is in, in terms of civil society's engagement in this, full, in this week, during the press conference at 11, the, the for, Financing for Development Group had a, their, their mascot, which is a globe, kind of a soft globe called tax body. They were there, and they were actually pulled out of the room. I mean, I was sitting right here, and they were pulled out of the room. The, 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 the civil society group complained and said they had an agreement, this thing could come, and they questioned whether the UN is really open to civil society groups participating in this, I guess, sort of a new way with a, with a soft globe on the podium. What steps have you taken to make sure that civil society can participate this week, and how can you explain the, the physical ouster, uh, as my files were physically ousted on, on, over the weekend from the UN, of this globe? What does it say about the, with the way in which the UN is going? Thank you. Well, the only thing I can say is that, that uh, we are doing, at my office, in the things we organize ourselves, whatever we can, to integrate civil society in the discussions. That's what we're doing. When, we, when it comes to, to uh, particular GA-mandated uh, arrangements, there are rules and regulations in this organization I cannot uh, put aside. Uh, I think you know that uh, as well. Uh, and that can limit the access for some uh, civil society organizations. About the tax issue, I mean, I think my basic observation is that the uh, Panama Papers has speeded up uh, the number of countries now uh, uh, telling us that they will abide with the regulations which is proposed by the OECD and makes the, the work we are doing in cooperation with the OECD to fight against tax evasion easier. And, 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 and of course, every organization should have a look in those papers, in every country, in those papers, and see do we have any particular problems associated with this. Uh, I, I mean, we have seen already that one prime minister at least had left office. <laughs> because of those papers, uh, and, uh, and there are a remarkable number of high officials around the world present, uh, and well-placed people present on that list, which is deplorable, but also enlightening for a, a process that could lead forward to a much more efficient uh, uh, global 
fight against tax evasion and tax havens. I think, I, I think the President's been rather modest in his, his answer to your civil society question. I mean, as you all observed for the um, uh, informal dialogues with the SG candidates, uh, the, 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 the President called for a questions from civil society. He made sure those questions were asked in the sessions. Uh, on video, you saw all of those questions. We had over a thousand questions come in from civil society mm -hmm. as a result of a, a large social media campaign that encouraged people, any, anybody, uh, and, and, and uh, you know, large and small civil society organizations to ask questions. That was, that was done. And, and also in these meetings this week, I mean, there's a very large numbers, number of uh, NGOs and civil society coming to the, the special session on, on the world drug problem. And also uh, to our event, we've got, uh, we've got five speakers who have been given room in the program at our event on Thursday. Uh, those, those are speakers who have been invited and have been selected by civil society organizations to represent uh, you know, their best interests. But let's take the next question. Uh, uh, Evelyn. Yes, Evelyn Leopold. Thank you for the press conference. Um, the process you started on the Secretary General candidates, do you think it now is nearly impossible for the Security Council to endorse a candidate, perhaps one who speaks gibberish, who did not appear before the General Assembly? And I have a second question after you finish. Uh, of course, nothing is impossible, but I think it's very unlikely that uh, the Secretary General should be chosen not from, should not be chosen from the list of people presented in the General Assembly. And, and uh, another, uh, sorry. Another question, is there any uh, possibility that there would be complete financing of the PGA post in light of the John Ash case. Is that kind of money in the works or not? Well, there are a good process on both the organization, financing and transparency of the, the, the office of the PGA, not only uh, for this PGA. I mean, we have made the widest possible uh, transparency on the work we are doing, but, but that has to be codified for future uh, offices of the PGA as well, as I think there is an, an, a need for a, a more permanent staffing also financed by the UN itself, so that we can uh, create a much stronger institutional memory in that institution. Given the large number of uh, work now, asked for by the office of the PGA in, 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 in uh, steering different processes and following uh, uh, negotiation processes, appointing co-facilitation. So, so uh, uh, I, and I think there is a very positive uh, uh, mood around uh, taking that kind of decisions in the revitalization committee. I was there for a couple of week, uh, a week ago or so, uh, for a couple of hours, uh, listening to the discussion, taking part in it. Uh, so I think decisions will be taken. I know not exactly the details that will be decided, but I think we will make a huge step forward here. Great. Thank you. The president has to go, unfortunately. He's, uh, he's uh, uh, going to be late for his next meeting. So thank you very much indeed for your attention, and we look forward to uh, continuing to answer your questions.